Well, hello, everyone. It's been a wonderful few days learning about everyone's truly fascinating work here. My name is Esther Showalter. I'm three and a half years into a PhD in computer science with the Mobility Management and Networking Lab at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And this work, Tribal Mobility and COVID-19 and Urban Rural Analysis in New Mexico, was funded in part by the NSF through grants and a graduate research fellowship. Well, last year, coronavirus messed up all of our lives, but it also provided a unique opportunity for an unprecedented level of data sharing, especially data about human mobility. Now, my usual research focuses on internet accessibility, particularly by mobile devices on tribal lands in the United States, so Native American reservations and sovereign territories which means that when coronavirus hit last year, we already had access to a mobile device LTE data set in New Mexico that contained location information. And we had relationships with the tribal communities that could share with us insight into how human mobility and case growth seemed to be characterized differently in tribal areas and in rural and urban areas in general, uh, differently than was typical US-wide. So to show what I mean, in New Mexico over last spring, we saw two of the counties that overlap with Navajo Nation in the northwest corner here, McKinley and San Juan. They remain consistently among the highest affected counties in the entire United States. And this gained national news, especially as cases within Native American communities alone made up more than 35% of all cases in New Mexico from as early on as April. And while these communities still make up less than 10% of the population. By June, cases among Native Americans made up more than 55% of all cases in New Mexico. And so there's been plenty of research showing that indigenous and minority people groups are often more susceptible to various diseases, and especially during pandemics, which compound on pre-existing conditions. Uh, more susceptible than the majority of the population. And lots of factors have been studied that lead into this susceptibility. Among them are basic needs like access to clean water or medicine or hospitals, or where my usual work comes into it, a usable internet connection so you can actually get the information and the help that you need when you need it. <clears throat> but mobility was pegged from the start of this pandemic as a key factor in increasing exposure. And so the main prophylactic approach nationwide was to stay home and limit non-essential travel. But a month and more after the stay-at-home order was issued in New Mexico in March, cases on tribal lands were still surging. And while there was also a growing body of research on correlating human mobility with case growth as a prediction and a planning tool, there was very little insight into the type of sub-county regional categories of mobility that would be useful to assess the tribal and rural regions of New Mexico uh, and help health planners and tribal leadership get ahead of this pandemic spread. And so we set out to see what public case data we could use what mobility metrics we could use from the LTE data set we already had, uh, and if we could find a good method of categorizing mobility into sub-county regional regions in a way that accurately reflects the behavior of residents in those regions. And once we've done all that, to answer the question of how we can even analyze this to help with this pandemic going forward. So our case data set comes from the New Mexico Department of Health, which publishes daily case counts for each county as a total. And from that, we can calculate the daily case change and the daily growth rate, which is just the natural log of the ratio from one day to the previous of the amount of new cases recorded each day. So this is what case counts look like for all counties in New Mexico as a percentage of their populations. And you can see, as I mentioned before, in San Juan and McKinley, uh, these two counties are huge outliers from the rest of the state. Uh, and we have a human mobility data set from a company called Skyhook that offers location services to a variety of third-party apps that do navigation and geofencing triggers or targeted ads. So Skyhook estimates they have between 1 and 5% of the U.S. population using apps that contribute to this data set, which works out to about 75 million active users each day nationwide. However, there's no one way of measuring human mobility, and that's because it's a gross invasion of privacy to actually track people and then publish the movement of individuals. So many companies that have made mobility data public, like Google, or you may have used SafeGraph, 
will only publish numbers of visits to different types of places like parks or grocery stores by an entire county and then see how those change which is an informative way of aggregating a mobility metric to preserve individual privacy. But these public data sets don't help with our task of examining sub-county regional differences, especially because tribal boundaries rarely overlap neatly with county boundaries. So what having access to this skyhook data set gives us is a metric they call itinerancy, which approximates by the diagonal of the bounding box, the average distance traveled by all devices within a census block group each day. So a block group is a US Census Bureau geographical unit that encapsulates about 1200 residents at minimum 200 residents. And block groups can be varying sizes depending on the concentration of the population. But there are about 1500 of them in New Mexico, which means about 43 for each county. That gives us about 233,000 data points each one is an average itinerancy for each block group and each day between January 1st and June 9th. So instead of having to look at movement in an entire county, I can look at these much more fine-grained block groups, which still obscure the movements of any one individual by grouping them together with up to 1,200 other people. So we can take itinerancy then and plot it for each day averaged over all block groups. But one technicality going forward is that in a lot of the news, we talk about mobility changes in terms of a percentage difference from some sort of pre-coronavirus normal. And so to get to that level of comparison, we choose a baseline set of dates in January and February and take the median itinerancy from that period to be our control for normal behavior. Since true normal behavior will vary geographically and from weekdays to weekends, we end up taking a unique pre-coronavirus median for each block group and each day of the week. And then for subsequent days, we can measure itinerancy as a percentage increased or decreased from that pre-coronavirus median. So we chose a date range that excluded New Year's travel and ran through February 6th, since that's similar to what Google and a lot of the other big data sets did. But we found that varying the baseline from just three weeks in January or even extending it through mid-March did not strongly change any of our results. So when I refer to mobility as a percentage change from here on out, I mean this difference in itinerancy from normal. Uh, and so we see exactly what we expect to see in this plot. After the stay-at-home order on March 23rd, mobility statewide plummeted by about 25%. And in fact, it started this major decline around the 12th, which was when schools closed and then only slowly crept back up towards normal in June. Uh, but we want to break this up now into regional categories. And so we need to map out a meaningful method to label each individual block group as tribal or non-tribal, and then as urban or rural. So for the tribal categorization, we can say that if a block group boundary overlaps with a legal tribal boundary by 50% or more, then the entire block group is tribal. And that gives us this map where you can see there are underlying gray swaths which show the legal tribal boundaries and then the brown census block groups are those that are categorized as tribal by area overlap. And then all location measurements recorded on, on devices passing through these tribal block groups count as tribal mobility. So this is a very rough estimate and without getting feet on the ground and surveying every single block group to tell whether data points are local residents or are just passing through on highways. It's impossible to know how accurate this labeling scheme is. So this is one of the sources of uncertainty in our results that remains to be fine-tuned in future research. And still, this leaves us with about 7.7% of our data set coming from nearby tribal lands. And that's actually representative of the population since Native Americans make up about 9% of New Mexico residents. And so it's a good enough labeling scheme to start observing some general trends. The urban rural labeling is more straightforward. The Census Bureau already assigns urban rural labels to individual blocks. And so if we take the 50% approach for all blocks in a group, you can see the urban rural distribution leaves us with about a 30-70 split in actual data points, which is also fairly representative of the population recorded by the Census Bureau. And so then we can combine these two labeling schemes and assign every block group to be either non-tribal rural, non-tribal urban, tribal rural, and tribal urban. And it's interesting that although the non-tribal urban data makes up the majority of the data set, the 
majority of the land area here is actually covered by non-tribal rural block groups. So tribal, tribal rural block groups make up a good chunk of especially the Northwest on Navajo Nation. And urban areas, both tribal and non-tribal, are tightly concentrated around Santa Fe and Albuquerque and Gallup and up in the Farmington Shiprock area. So we can take our statewide mobility plot from earlier and divide it up into regional categories. And already we can start to see a post-coronavirus trend. So the red line, tribal rural mobility, remains consistently highest. So it did diminish after the stay-at-home order, but not as far as, say, the blue line, tribal non-tribal urban mobility, which remains consistently on the bottom of the stack. So this suggests that, yes, there are meaningful trends that can, we can continue exploring uh, with more rigorous analysis. And so to tie these regional trends into quantifying how much mobility corresponds to and may even predict case growth, our next step is a statistical correlation analysis. So conveniently, we can compare results with a study published by IBM Labs for a county level data set that considered every state in the US. And similarly to their process, when we plot mobility and case growth, just from March through June, since March 1st is about two weeks before cases started appearing, um, we can see when we plot that the case growth surges, these spikes here, show up just over two weeks after the mobility peaks, which makes sense because coronavirus can take more than a week to develop symptoms, and then it can take days or another week for people to get themselves tested and get results. And our case data counts the number of positive cases reported that day. So in order to accomplish a correlation, we need to lag or delay mobility in time so that any surges line up with case growth surges. And similar to this IBM paper, we lag case growth behind mobility for an increasing number of days, normalize the lagged arrays, and then do a Pearson correlation at each day to find out how many lag days produces the highest correlation coefficient. So the IBM paper found that US-wide, the highest correlation is at 19 days. And when we checked their data for New Mexico, they had 17 days. But when, but when we did this correlation with Skyhook data, you can see the peak coefficient on that plot is around 13 days. So there's variation here in lag days that must be introduced by the different granularities of the metrics making up the two different mobility data sets. So our lag times are still within reason, but we note this as an avenue for further exploration. Uh, and then we can repeat this correlation for mobility divided into our regional categories within each county and case growth for the entire county. And when we consider all counties together, we find that out of all the correlation coefficients, tribal rural and tribal urban are distinctly higher than the other regions. So this is not exactly a surprising result. It shows that mobility in regions that we already know have high numbers of cases had a stronger correlation to case growth. However, the novelty here is that while this is anecdotally obvious, since anyone living in a county will know where in their county people are mostly affected, but we're now able to show that this is one way of quantifying how much different, how much different regions are affected without already knowing the underlying regional distribution of cases within that county. And so to compactly visualize results by each county, we can organize counties by the percentage of the population that have experienced cases. So again, McKinley and San Juan were the clear outliers by case severity. So we're gonna call them rank one. And then we evenly cut through the remaining case severity numbers to group counties into four ranks with uneven amounts of counties in each rank, but similar amount of case affectation. Uh, and so when we inspect mobility in regional categories grouped by these ranks, we can see these trends are clarified. Tribal mobility typically correlates more highly with county case growth. And within tribal, urban dominates rural, but otherwise rural mobility dominates urban uh, in terms of, of uh, affecting case growth. Uh, and so you can see in this grouping, the variation in lag days here, the L columns, are slightly suspicious since an exceptionally low or high number of days is likely an unrealistic time between case exposure and testing, especially a low number of days back in March before testing was so widespread. Uh, and, and so these outlier days likely indicate uncertainty in the data set. However, notice how the lowest lag days appear in the non-tribal rural 
category for all rankings. And these correlations all had higher p-values than any other region. So all p-values were less than 0 0.01. The bolded values were less than 0 0.05. And this one starred value in rank three was greater than 0 0.05. And so statistically indistinguishable from random. And so part of our continuing research will be exploring what factors are introducing this noise or variability in certain regions and counties, whether it's data sparsity from certain block groups or calibration in labeling the regional categories or sifting out what amount of noise is mobility measurements from highway through travelers relative to local travelers whose movement patterns are more likely to lead to interactions that spread the virus. Um, or com com comparing to similar analyses with other mobility and case data sets as they become available. So this whole project has shown how useful a much more fine-grained data collection method could be for both cases and for mobility. Uh, but of course, better data means more voluntary disclosure of sensitive private information. And I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. And honestly, I don't think it should happen without much stronger guarantees of anonymity. Um, so still, the amount of detail we've been able to tease out of these two data sets, it's still quite granular levels, two different granularities, block group levels and county levels. Uh, the amount of detail we've been able to get out of it has been able to demonstrate and quantify some surprisingly useful results. So particularly, we've been able to show that since April, it was evident that the stay-at-home restriction did not function as designed to decrease mobility in regions where coronavirus was already most dangerous. So when we showed these results to social scientist partners who live and work with Native American communities, they were not surprised to see tribal mobility so unusually high relative to other regions. In fact, from reports from Boots on the Ground, the shortages in many essential groceries and water and, medic and medical supplies in late March, these shortages partially exacerbated by panic over the stay at home order often forced reservation and other rural residents to travel much farther than usual. And on top of the shortages, there were the new problems of non-essential workers still needing to find a weekly income to survive, uh, and the complications of childcare and needing to take kids to where they can safely spend a day and get their schoolwork done when schools are actually closed. So health officials had access to case growth in these smaller regions, but likely not mobility data at any granularity. And if they had had this mobility data, that might have been one more way of quantifying across the state how restrictions were working in different regions and may have helped better characterize the needs of these regions for specialized response much earlier on. Uh, that said, this is a plot of the current case situation in New Mexico. And the numbers we're talking about are from just this first wave in June. And our results so far were as of October. This most recent third wave has been almost 10 times as bad as that first, but currently is coming back under control with vaccinations and uh, a herd immunity likely. So while our analysis is hopefully not going to be needed anytime in the near future, we hope that it can be a means of backtracing what actually happened in these hardest hit regions and can help put effective measures in place earlier before the next global health pandemic can take hold. Uh, so adding on the social context was crucial for interpreting these results, and we hope that by making these findings more public, we'll be able to facil facilitate better the general conversation around this problem by giving the people who are actually affected by these challenges a means of quantifying and characterizing their experiences. And so moving forward with this project, we're continuing to sort through the impact of each of the factors I've mentioned in the last slide. We're expanding on applications of this urban rural mobility analysis to non-pandemic characteristics of people's lives and bringing in demographic factors that might help characterize things like LTE coverage availability in different regions. Uh, and we've got more data to analyze. We're aiming to consider all of 2020 in New Mexico. And we've also expanded to California, an even more regionally diverse state. Uh, and so we're excited to see how these results will bear with the wider data set. Uh, so thanks for listening.